I'm so excited for this week. We are kicking off uh, what's gonna be a three-week series, uh, a collection of conversations regarding the kingdom of God. And we've called this series Citizens, that if you are a believer, follower of Christ, you have dual citizenship. You are, yes, a citizen of this wonderful nation of ours, uh, but simultaneously, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And much of our task is figuring out how do we navigate life and how do we discern the complexity of our world, also that we can live in a way that adds value to those around us in our community, in our society, as well as honoring God at the same time. And so that's really the heartbeat behind uh, this series. I have entitled today's message, What a Miss. Someone say that. Say, what a miss. You ever looked at a situation like, oh, what a miss. And I look at my life and I see a lot of whiffs and times in which I got it wrong and I, things I've experienced or witnessed where it's like, oh, what a miss. And in this, I know that there's going to be probably a tension and it's probably gonna be a healthy tension, but I do believe uh, we as a community of faith are at a place where I do think we can handle these conversations in a way that honors God and uh, creates unity and clarity for us as we move forward in the times in which we're living. And as I was thinking about this series, I was thinking about uh, my childhood. I was uh, raised as a pastor's child, and the rumor is what it is. Uh, sometimes pastor's kids uh, can be a little wild, and I had my own journey of rebellion. Uh, but I remember a, a season where uh, my dad was a youth pastor at a small church, and this church had a Christian school meeting in it. And so for a year, I got to attend this Christian school. And it was really uh, strict and had a lot of rules and standards. In fact, parents would sign over permission for the school to discipline their children. Uh, anyone have this experience? You went to one of these schools where you got to be disciplined by the faculty or the staff. Like if you were ever acting out of line or you know being disrespectful or misbehaving, which was the case for me at times, you would be sent to the principal's office where you had to stand on this mat, aligning your feet with the footprints on the ground, and they would adjust this robotic arm to your hind end. And then you would stand there as the robotic arm would ch -ch 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 and spank you on the butt. Come on, wave at me if you've ever been spanked by a robot. <laughs> it's all right, don't worry. AI's coming for all of us, right? But in addition to that, they, they had all these things. You know, I remember if you were tardy three times, uh, you had to give up the first five minutes of recess for a punishment. And what you had to do was hold a penny with your nose up against a brick wall for five minutes. So all of us would sit there cross-eyed, trying not to let it slip. It was terrible. And I say all that because I do remember some things about that school that still to this day stick with me. I still think about it. I, I remember it vividly. I don't know if there's experiences in your childhood that you can just remember as if it were yesterday. One of the great privileges uh, of the day was every single day we would say the Pledge of Allegiance. And we would say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag. And then we would say the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag. Have you ever heard of the Christian flag, anyone? Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful tradition and the sentiment behind it is something that I really appreciate. You know, uh, pledging our allegiance to the kingdom of God, his word and his will, it's, it's great. And every day, two kids got to have the opportunity to lead the classroom in those pledges. And so you'd basically get up there and if you didn't know the words, all you had to say is I pledge and then the whole choir takes the rest. And once a year, every student got the honor to go out to the flagpole and be the individual who raised both the American flag and the Christian flag to the top of the flagpole. And one day there was this conversation where one of my classmates asked the teacher, she said, why is it that the American flag is on top and the Christian flag is on the bottom? And I still to this day, I remember my teacher's response. She said, you know, I don't really know how to answer that, but I do know that if you put the Christian flag on top, uh, people get offended, so we're not gonna do that. And I just remember that statement. And what, is, what a strange thing to place into the hearts and minds of kids that if your faith ever trumps your patriotism, uh, that is something that is irritating and offensive and something should be avoided. And I say all that because you fast forward in my life I become a pastor myself, my first pastorate. I'm the youth pastor at this small church and uh, we were renovating the auditorium. 
It had pews and green carpet everywhere and the whole back of the wall was wood paneling and there was fake flowers everywhere. And on the platform, once again, were these two flags, an American flag and a Christian flag. And a lot of times when you do projects in the church, you, you're rushing because the weekend's always around the corner. So you have to get things done and then tidy it up as quickly as you can so we can gather on the weekend. And so we rip up the carpet and these contractors are doing their work and the weekend comes and we have service. And afterwards, a group of families came up to me and let me know of their disappointment because we had not placed the two flags back on the platform. And I told him, I said, you know, this is actually was not a calculated decision. It wasn't something that we discussed. I, I just think they actually didn't make their way back up there. And this and gentleman in the group said, you know, I get it. You guys are trying to clean up the platform, make space for other things. Uh, you know, you don't have to put all of them back up there. Just put the American flag back up there. Uh, to which I was like, all of them? There's only two. And I'm so embarrassed to admit this because the next week as we gathered in worship, there was no Christian flag, but there was an American flag on our platform. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my goodness, at some point you have got to graduate from being a coward in your leadership. What a miss. Now a good communicator always creates tension on the front end so everyone's paying attention, which I sense I've already done. Uh, but to set the record straight for those of you who are quick to misinterpret, uh, know this, I absolutely love our nation. 100% I believe this is the greatest nation on the planet and in human history. I love the United States, I love America. I think we're far from perfect, but my goodness, uh, have we got some things right and some things going for us. I, I love patriotism and I, I love celebrating the sacrifice and the service that so many people bravely uh, have committed to, to provide the rights and freedoms that we have. Uh, so you and I can gather in a place like this. I, I think it's wonderful. I also uh, fully believe uh, that our nation was formed, shaped, and founded uh, upon Christian and Judeo virtues and values and biblical instruction and truth. And I do think if you were to extract biblical truth and Judeo-Christian values from America, our nation uh, would be unrecognizable. I think that's true. And my goal here is not to say, hey, we're gonna you know, create some agenda to where everyone's gonna do away with their American flags and we're all gonna raise Christian flags at our home. Uh, th that's not the agenda here. The, the goal in saying this is to just share this tension that I think we all can relate to, that there comes a point uh, where our patriotism and our politics seem to be in tension with our faith. And the question is, is which one takes precedence over the other? D does your politics shape your faith or does your faith shape your politics? And I am confident, I'm probably going to stand in the middle today and whether you are on the left side of things or on the right side of things, I'm going to irritate every single one of you. Um, <laughs> Because as a church, we exist uh, to promote one person and one person only, and his name is Jesus, and he is the King of Kings, and he is the Lord of Lords. And that's who we give our adoration to. That is who we bow our knee to. And all throughout scripture, in fact, you could go from page one to the last page, you find this emphasis, this theme, this narrative, this overarching message of the kingdom of God. In the beginning, it says God creates his wonderful and majestic, beautiful, perfect creation. And there comes a point where the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have a board meeting and they say, hey, let us now create our masterpiece. Let us create humanity in our image and our likeliness. And in that moment, you find God placing the thumbprint of God himself upon humanity. And it's, it's beautiful. And immediately there's this mission, there's this mandate, this instruction to be fruitful, to multiply, to rule, and to reign over the earth. 
Right off the bat in the early pages of scripture, you find the kingdom in the garden was marked with royalty and nobility and the thumbprint of heaven upon our life represented a kingship that was in God. It's amazing. And I think sometimes we, we overlook this emphasis. You get to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and it brings into startling clarity the kingdom of God and his throne and God's sovereign rule and reign over the world and his redemptive and complete plan when all is said and done. And in between it all is the unfolding of God's redemptive plan because what happens in the garden? Man and woman are in perfection, walking in the garden, in fellowship with God, and then comes Satan. And Satan's strategy is so boring. It's so predictable. It's apparent and obvious and consistent to this day. And he comes to Adam and Eve and he sells them on a lie. And he gets them to question God's integrity, question God's goodness and his faithfulness, to doubt the word of God. And in doing so, they believe a liar over God. And what happens? It cracks the door for chaos to enter in and ensue in their life. And the same strategy is being employed in your life, in the lives of your spouse or your kids, your, your coworkers, your classmates, your teammates, your neighbors, is this temptation, this nagging, prodding question. Do you really trust God? Is he good? Is he faithful? And does he have integrity? And can you take him at his word? And every single time we take the bait, we too crack the door for chaos in our life. Now, the good news is, is the moment this happens, God doesn't abandon humanity. God immediately makes a declaration that I am going to set things right. And all that was broken, I am going to restore and I am going to redeem humanity and the world. You know, I'm thankful that God doesn't throw in the towel on us, that he doesn't abandon us, that he doesn't run from our brokenness, but he leans in with redemption and grace within his heart. And so how does God do it? God goes to a man by the name, uh, name of Abraham and gives him a promise. If you take me at my word, I will rise up within you such a movement that you will be a blessing to the world. And Abraham raises up a family that produces a tribe that then becomes a nation. And what is that nation's name? Israel. It's a wonderful story. It's documented all throughout the Old Testament in which the nation of Israel was marked and led by leaders and prophets and individuals who would declare the word of God and the coming of the Messiah, the chosen king, and all of these things that God would eventually bring to pass and fulfill. It is amazing. At some point, God's gonna set things right. At some point, God is going to establish his kingdom in the world. And then what happens? Jesus shows up. It's amazing. And then uh, in doing so, he begins to inaugurate the kingdom of God. And in fact, as you go through the pages of the gospel, you have to ask yourself the question, what was the overarching primary message of Jesus's life? And what you find is Jesus had such an emphasis and priority placed on the kingdom. In fact, in the gospels, the kingdom is referenced 126 times. Now, I don't know what it's like for you, but anytime I get into a car, I love listening to the music. And have you ever found that you have to always adjust the stereo? Anyone else, you just can't accept the stock settings. Uh, you gotta adjust the treble and the mid range. And come on, anyone all about that bass, about that bass, right? You gotta turn that joker up. And I think when it comes to our theology, and I find in a lot of conversations that I have with Christians, it is clear uh, there's some things we have right, but this idea of the kingdom and kingdom theology is something that we need to drastically dial up, especially in the times in which we're living. Jesus, you find him referencing the kingdom in his preaching, in his prayers, in his parables, and in his priorities. I mean, think about Jesus's first sermon. You do your own study. God shows up on the scene and his very first message is repent. In other words, change your mind, turn from your ways, repent because the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. When it comes to his prayers, the kingdom also was at the forefront of his emphasis. The disciples who were steeped in religion, 
raised in the temple, surrounded by religious practice. Individuals who would have participated and witnessed prayer over and over again, every single day of their life. Look at the way Jesus would pray. And they thought, wow, there's something so different about his approach and his effectiveness in the way in which he talks to his father. So they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? And Jesus responds with what is now infamously known as what? The Lord's Prayer, which starts out, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In other words, Jesus isn't saying, hey, when you pray, pray this verbatim as, as much as he's saying, here is a model and an approach to prayer. First and foremost, remember who you're talking to. We ought to approach the throne of God with confidence as children, knowing that he embraces and accepts us. But we also ought to approach God with some reverence. I am speaking to the, the creator of all things. I am speaking to a sovereign God. I am speaking to the source of all logic and wisdom and truth. And I come to him recognizing who it is that I'm interacting with. And the first thing out of my mouth is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus is saying, when you, when you pray, there should be an anticipation a longing, a desire, a fervency, a zeal, a, a, you know, just this faith-filled appetite for God's kingdom to come to pass in our life. God, I wanna see your kingdom come. And I wanna be a part of seeing it unfold within the world. It was in his prayers. In fact, in John chapter 17, Jesus is about to be crucified. And there is what is called the priestly prayer. It's the longest prayer of Christ that we have on record. And what does he pray for? For you and for me. It's amazing. And this is where we actually get the language in the world, not of the world. Wave at me if you've ever heard that. You ever heard that statement? Yeah, where do we get that? From Jesus's prayer in John chapter 17. He says, just as I am not of this world, neither are they of this world. They are in the world, but not of the world. And what does he go on to pray? He says, God, would you, would you help them remain faithful? Would you protect them and keep them in your ways and in your truth and in your will? They are in the world, but not of the world. My kingdom, once again, is referenced in his prayers. You find this in his parables. Jesus is always fielding all these random questions and people trying to get him caught up in his theology and trick him or test him. And Jesus so profoundly would respond to loaded questions with really creative parables. I love that. I sometimes want to try that on for size. The next time someone comes up to me with a really loaded theological question, I'm going to be like, you know, the kingdom of God is like chapstick. <laughs> and it only works with the cap off. And just walk away and just be like, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. <laughs> but what is amazing is if you go and look at the parables, almost all of them start with the same sentence. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who went out and planted seed. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a fisher who goes out and with these nets and it's the kingdom of God. And essentially it's Jesus creatively enticing every single one of us to say, hey, would you imagine a place that operates like this? Would you imagine a place where these are the values? Would you imagine a place where your participation represents this? It's in his parables. It's amazing. And it's also in his priorities. Once more, Jesus filled in questions about life and purpose and eternity and God's will. And what does he turn and say? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things, you know, all the things that we, you know, tend to give our adoration to and devotion to all these, you know, minor preferences. Yeah, all that other stuff is not to say it's bad, but seek first the kingdom of God. This is the priority. And you, you see this emphasis. Now we live in what theologians would call the already, but not yet side of history. Sounds like a contradiction, right? Essentially what you need to understand, and maybe this is something you get together with your life groups and discuss three words, and that would be inauguration, coronation, and consummation. 
So essentially Jesus shows up and he inaugurates the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. He's inaugurating and ushering in the kingdom of God. And then what happens? He gets executed and murdered, but then he comes back from the grave, resurrects, and scripture tells us he ascends. And where does he ascend to? The throne of God. It's coronation day in which the crown of glory was placed upon him. You see, here's the problem. We are so good at celebrating Easter and Christmas that we cast a shadow on his coronation. Yeah, Jesus was born in a cradle, but he didn't stay there. Yeah, Jesus was hung on a cross, but he didn't stay there. The one who lied in a cradle and was you know, hung on a cross now bears a crown and he is the king of glory, the king of kings, and he reigns supreme. And scripture says that he will bring to full completion his redemptive plan in the world. He will set all things right because here's what you have to understand. The kingdom in the garden was never meant to be isolated and contained in the garden. The garden kingdom was meant to be a global kingdom. And God does not throw in the towel on his plans and his promises. He says, no, at some point, I am going to renew and restore all things. I'm going to rescue it all. And I am going to establish a new heavens and a new earth. And it's gonna be amazing. And the invitation for every single one of us is to be a part of that process and establishing, representing, and living out kingdom virtues and values in the world. And this is something that comes to the surface in the days of Jesus. And it's something that's coming to the surface in our life as well. When the moment calls for it and the pressure's on, who gets the utmost of your allegiance? Is it Jesus or is it someone or something else? And just know if your allegiance, if you're a Christian and you bow your knee to anyone else besides Christ, it's a miss. Now, as Jesus would go throughout the region, he's teaching all these things. Uh, who does he begin to infuriate? I love Jesus because he would befriend prostitutes, dine with criminals, touch lepers, and all the while he would do what? Offend the Pharisees. These religious folks couldn't stand him, couldn't stand what he was doing, couldn't stand what he was saying, especially when he started to identify as the Messiah, the chosen one, the, the king and the son of God. They thought this was blasphemous. And so they immediately decide we have to take him out. Let's kill him. And it's just amazing because standing right in front of them is Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the religious elite can't even see it. Why is that? How, how do we develop such blind spots? You ever notice that you have some blind spots? If you can't see them, that's a form of blindness. Um, but I think what happens to all of us is when something doesn't meet our expectations or our assumptions, we develop blind spots. And for the religious people, they had all these prophecies that God was gonna come and establish his rule and his reign and his kingdom that you know Isaiah would say, for unto us a child is born and he will be called mighty God, prince of peace, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, and the government would be upon his shoulders. And so they were anticipating a military leader. They were anticipating a revolutionist and somebody who would come and lead with an iron fist and somebody who would put the smack down on the crazy. Which, come on, don't all of us want God to put the smack down on some of the crazy? I wish he did throw lightning bolts at sometimes. But he doesn't show up and lead the way we would assume. He doesn't look like any other leader the world has ever offered. And so we look at the great leaders of history and we find that there tends to be a pretty common theme. theme. Most leaders lead with brute force. And then here comes Jesus leading with sovereign love and they don't even see it. Like this is not what we were expecting. We thought you'd show up with a sword, not with a towel. And here's what you find as you follow Christ, you're gonna discover you and I are called to fight with folded hands, not clenched fists. 
that we just engage differently. And it represents a God who is not of this world, who does not take his cues from anyone else. He is the standard. And so Caiaphas, the high priest and the others drag Jesus into the company of the Romans and they hand him over to Pontius Pilate to be murdered. And there's this really interesting dialogue that goes back and forth. Pontius Pilate is examining Jesus and then discussing things with the, the religious elite. And the, the overarching conversation is Pilate saying to them, guys, I can't find anything wrong with him. Are you sure you want me to kill him? And they're like, absolutely crucify him. Well, how about taking Barabbas? No, crucify him. Well, the man's innocent. And there's this back and forth. And watch what happens in John chapter 18. This conversation is brilliant because there are some questions here that if you lean into them are pretty profound. And I think they bring some things to the surface in every single one of us. Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this from your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Going on, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. Again, this is so different than what we expect, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. To which Jesus responds, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. In other words, to stand as evidence and proof of truth in a world full of lies. And everyone who hears, who everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Massive statement. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? <laughs> Which is the question of our day. What is truth? Is there anything as truth? Or is it your truth and just my truth? And we're all just living random autonomous lives where it really doesn't matter. YOLO, you only live once, do as you please. And just know that what you do doesn't affect anybody else. Well, folks, how's that working for us? Yep. Yep. And Jesus is like, no, I came so that people can understand that there's some sense behind this. I came representing the architect of the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who baked sense into everything. There's logic and there's wisdom and there's truth. In fact, Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth and the life. Is there truth? Of course there's truth. And Pilate asks him some questions that I think are just amazing. Jesus comes into the headquarters and Pilate says, so you're the king of the Jews. I mean, this is amazing because Pilate is in many ways having his own revelation, his own spiritual awakening. Here is a man who has spent his time, his whole career in military and in power. And he understands working for Caesar, Caesar, uh, Caesar and all the different ranks and policies. He understands how kings operate. And so he looks at Jesus and he's like, oh, I, I see what's happening here. I'm in the presence of a king. You're a king. And clearly you are fulfilling everything these people believe. Are you the king of the Jews? And it's amazing to me that Pilate can see it, but Caiaphas can't. Caiaphas was not just a high priest, the high priest. I mean, so take a breather for a second because this is exposes individuals like myself. He, he was supposed to be the standard bearer of spiritual authority and wisdom to discern the will of God and the word of God on behalf of the people. And this godly man in that 
precious and important of a role, can't even see what's standing right in front of them. My goodness, should we all just humble ourselves and recognize that at times we all get it wrong. The high priest can't see this is your king, but Pilate can. And Pilate's caught in the middle of this weird tension. I am trying to appease these religious extremists. And I'm also trying to serve the political pressure that I'm under. And I, I just wonder if any of you can relate to Pilate's tension. And so he says, so you're the king of the Jews. To which Jesus is, he's masterful. He never gives anyone an easy answer. He just responds with a question. Go deeper with that. And what does he ask him? He says, okay, so do you say this on your own accord? Or did someone tell you this? In other words, what he's saying is, are you having a revelation? Are you coming to the awareness of who I am? Or are you just mimicking a talking point you heard from somebody else? And this is something that I think we need to be honest about in terms of cultural Christianity within our nation. There was a study done in 1990. You gotta pay attention to this. In 1990, 90% of adults, individuals over the age of 18 in America identified as a Christian. Well, that's pretty impressive. We should have been doing all right over the last 30 years. So what has happened when nine out of 10 were Christians? Well, look what's happened over the last 30 years in our nation. In fact, Christianity and the faith has been on a massive decline to where now they say as of 2021, only 62, roughly just under 63% of adults in America identify as a Christian. Meaning 30% have abandoned the faith. Now I read one study and they say, you know, you have to factor in people passing away and you also have to factor in people moving into the nation. But they said, essentially what you're looking at there is the equivalent of anywhere from 50 to 70 million people abandoning Christ, walking away from the faith. I think we ought to pay attention to this, folks. Scripture says in the last days, there will be a great falling away. And I don't know how you define great falling away, but 50 to 70 million feels like it's somewhere in the ballpark. And what is that revealing? It's revealing that for years we've gotten by on shallow veneer faith, superficial faith. And the same question Jesus says, are you discovering that I'm king? Are you willing to bow your knee to me or are you just mimicking a talking point that you heard from somebody else? And guys, I hate to say this, but what we're experiencing in our nation is a lot of fickle faith. Individuals are like, oh yeah, of course. I was a Christian when it was popular, but now that it comes with some pressure, I don't have the spine to stay with it. I don't have the resolute spirit and the devotion to God, recognizing all that he did for me and rising up in faith, doing all that I can for him. And what we have found is this fickle faith has just jumped at the next popular idea. And here's the case study we should do. And nobody wants to talk about this. And here's the thing that's going to get me in trouble and probably canceled again. And that is this. As we have seen this plummet of the faith within our nation, what have we seen the rise of? Nonsense. Filth and corruption and immorality and division and deceitfulness and lies and perversion and division. As one thing plummets, the other thing skyrockets. And no one wants to have a conversation where are we getting off track here? And, and so there's this call to you and I as Christians. In this moment, who are we going to be unwavering, devoted to, and pledge our greatest allegiance to? And here's the thing, folks, no president, in fact, you put all the presidents together, the ones you really like and the ones you really hate, all of them together, all the presidents have not done as much for you as Christ himself has done for you. Yeah. It's not even close. It's overwhelming how good he's been to us. Let's just start on a very basic level. Oxygen's pretty great. I mean, we could suffocate in a second if he decided to. 
I also appreciate things like gravity and the fact that you're staying in your seat while we're talking. I like that he gave our limbs joints because this would be a stiff way to live. I like that we have eyeballs and taste buds and the list goes on and on and don't even get me started on the cross because if all he did is part the skies and die in our place, we are blessed beyond measure. Blessed beyond measure. There's no one like him. He's God. He's the source of truth. He's the creator. He is sovereign and he's not abandoning any one of us. And he's the only perfect with an unblemished record who never lies. Why would you trade in your devotion for anything else besides Jesus Christ? And so there's this conversation and Jesus says, but you got to know it's, it's not going to look like the world expects it to look. My kingdom's not of this world. And so Pilate's like, oh my goodness, what do, I, what do I do in this situation? So he goes back out to the religious leaders. And watch what it reads. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover and it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. This is your guy. And they cried out away with him, away with him, crucify him. Now watch this. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Oh my goodness. I, I wish for a second, I'm not worthy of it, but I, I just wish God would give me 10 seconds with a microphone to speak to every Christian in America. Yes. Essentially, Pilate goes out to these religious folks and is like, folks, do you really want me to do away with this Jesus? <laughs> and I think we can look at our culture and we can look at all the things we're jumping at because here's the deal. There's always gonna be Vogue ideas and there's always gonna be another popular thought, but whoever marries the spirit of the age will eventually become a widow. Someone say, run it back. Run that back. Whoever marries the spirit of the age will eventually become a widow unless you anchor yourself in timeless truth, eternal truth, rooted in God's word and God's will. You're gonna live a wobbly life, frustrated that you can't discover a firm foundation. There's only one source. And the question is, is do you really want to do away with Jesus? What a question. Do we want to continue trying to do it on our own before we repent and humble ourselves and lean into his ways and surrender ourselves to his will? Do you really want to do away with Jesus? And watch how they respond. And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> what a miss. Oh, anytime the people of God, I don't care if you're left or right leaning, I don't care. Anytime the people of God choose Caesar over Christ, it's a miss. It's a massive miss. This is not to say that you and I shouldn't be passionate about our country. This is not to say that you and I shouldn't vote our values. This is not to say that you and I ought to engage in public life and be contributing members to this society. It's to say we do so in a way that takes our cues from a higher authority and we honor God in all that we do. It's critical. Folks, America can't save Christianity. America can't save the kingdom of God. <laughs> but the kingdom of God can save America. But as long as... This patriotism trumps your faith. You're adhering to Caesar over Christ. And, and here's the deal. I am proud to be an American. In fact, that's my jam. Anyone love that song? From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee. But my only question is, and maybe it's something all of us to think about. Which stirs more emotion and affection within you? Proud to be an American or amazing grace? I am proud to be an American. 
but I'm first a Christian and then an American. And my loyalty and allegiance is to Christ. And, and folks, we stand positioned and ready. Feels like we're on round three of chaos to add such significant value to our world, to just be agents of change who carry out kingdom virtue that we walk in integrity and we walk humbly. We care about justice and we extend mercy that we affirm the, the dignity and the imago day and the thumbprint of heaven upon people's life and we embrace community, right? That we are redemptive in nature and we seek reconciliation. These are kingdom virtues. And you can't tell me in the depths of your soul, you don't think, yeah, our world could use some of that. Hope, joy, love, peace, steadfastness, faithfulness, patience, goodness. And I don't want us to get down the road and look back on the opportunity that we had and think, oh, what a miss. What a miss. And so God, would you just quicken our cowardly souls to rise up in steadfast faithfulness, trusting you as the King of Kings.